So, are we doing well? Relaxed after the break? Okay. The, the more interactive it is, the more, um, yeah, the more interactive it is, the easier it'll be for you. Because I understand the difficulty of sitting there for four hours and trying to listen to, to concrete. So, I'm going to move to sulfate attack and then we'll go into testing. So, we've sort of covered this previously. So, sulfate attack, just like any other form of deterioration, should have two parts of it. Concrete being one part of it and then the boundary condition where you have sulfates present, the second part of it. Similar to chlorides, the cation part of the sulfate, whether that's sodium or, or magnesium, mm -hmm does play a large role, so just be aware when you see magnesium, they, they're quite a strong chemical, okay? But normally, and most normally, you get sodium sulfate uh, in, the, in, the, in the boundary condition. So the reaction is between the sulfate ion and the sodium with the calcium hydroxide, okay? Together they form calcium sulfate. Calcium sulfate is gypsum that you add to the cement clinker when you grind them for controlling the setting time. So it's something that cement already knows of. But the only problem is a calcium sulfate forming later on in the matrix have the same effect as freestyle or internal reactions. The crystals need to be accommodated and they're quite a big strong crystal which means it'll have to rupture it. Okay, so, and that's, that's the only issue. If you put sodium sulfate or hydrogen sulfuric acid, H2SO4, it can combine and attack the um, calcium hydroxide to form gypsum. Okay, it'll powder the cement away, powder the concrete away as well, because you will see in the form of acid attack, so let's say sulfuric acid is attacking the surface, you will slowly start to see that the cement recedes and the aggregate will start to pop out and eventually the aggregate will fall out. So it's a very slow, steady process. So if you look at a concrete and you're seeing a lot of aggregates projecting out, unless it's a design feature, expect that there's something attacking the uh, cement. You will see a lot of dusting as well along with it. Quite often the dusting might be washed away if it's in a pipe. All you see is just the aggregates popping and aggregates falling out doesn't mean by conclusive that that's sulfate attack, it could be freestyle attack, it could be salt efflorescence, but it is sulfate is one of the possible reasons. Where can you find sulfates? What's the most common residing place for sulfates? Yep. Um, so fertilizer is avid, yes, absolutely. I'm going to sit for a while. I'm getting tired by standing. Um, so fertilizers are one area. Anywhere else? Okay. Much more common example. Ground water has it. We'll have certain amount of sulfates. I think the codes might classify the water based on the exposure classification. Might actually say the concentration of sulfate should be blah blah. And then you classify the concrete. And the euro code it classifies as AC, I think. I don't know what A stands for. Probably alkali or prob some form of... Um, I don't know what A stands for. But again, in the euro code, it's quite hard to define what A stands for because it could be any European language for that matter. So the, the exposure classification there are AC something. Generally, the higher the number attached to it, the more severe the exposure is. And any other example of sulfates? Where? Salt. Salt? Soil, soil. Soils, okay. Yeah, soils, groundwater. I love it. There's a bit more common structure that undergoes a lot of sulfate. Sorry? Yes and pipes, sewage pipes. There is, sewage pipes are a mechanism. They're, they're something worth really looking at. They have a two part mechanism. So that's a pipe. 
and this is the top of the pipe and that's the bottom of the pipe. Okay. So here you will have the the sulfates will be reacting with um, calcium in the concrete. Okay, so you'll have gypsum formation here. And it will rupture these areas, okay. But there's also bacteria here. There's a lot of bacteria here. And there's bacteria here as well. And quite often this is a very moist, jelly sort of area. The net result is if the activities are quite high, you get a nice smell from it. The hydrogen sulfate will... This hydrogen sulfate will rise and then go to the top. And the other bacteria there converts it back to sulfuric acid. Okay, so that sulfuric acid will do the same job as it did here. It'll destroy the cement on the top. So if you look at pipes that's been there for long enough and have a lot of hydrogen sulfate in that environment, you will see the rib cage of the pipes. The cement is completely gone. Now you can see the rib cage, which means the amount of concrete that you have on top of it which is the structural load-bearing part of the pipe. Bottom failure is really not an issue, structurally speaking. It will still flow. It will spread. Contamination-wise, it's a problem. But structurally, that's not a problem. But top failing is a structural failure. And that's exactly where it fails. So, and if you see a, a big sinkhole appearing on a city all on a sudden, you can assume the pipe has given up. It is so severe in certain locations that the Concrete Pipe Association, CPSA, I don't know what the S stands for, in the UK say the pipe will last for 200 years. 200 years, that's the service life. They would say the pipes will last, which is true for a majority of the exposure, except where there's stale water. If you have stale water, 20 years if you're lucky. It is such a cheap product in the UK, <clears throat> but once you put it in place, digging it out is expensive, beyond imaginative. Like the cost of it will be very prohibitive. So we're now trying to get the UK to turn around completely and say, invest in your pipes, don't put the cheap products in. The, the companies produce the cheap product because that's the market, they're driven by the market market is not prepared to pay for a better pipe, therefore they're providing the solution. And we're trying to tell them, just look at the European countries. Germany, for example, they use self-compacting concrete for the pipes. They have a liner, a, a polymeric liner inside, and it's called, by a generic name called Perfect. Pipe. Perfect Pipe is an association and they produce pipes with the liner and their pipes doesn't look circular. Their pipes looks like that. Do you have any idea why they did that shape? So the pipe essentially looks like... So the circular part is here, the liner and everything else is same diameter and all of it. It's very thin, effective concrete. But why that shape? Why, why would they go into that shape? Circular pipes. We're so used to circular pipes. Why did the Perfect Pipe Association go from circular to non-circular? It's clever. The answer lies in the question of how the pipe can fail and handling the pipes. Have you guys seen how they handle the pipes from site to, from manufacturing to site? Take it in massive lorries, long pipes, different sections, all put in with wedges in place. Yeah. They lift it and they put it in place and the cranes remain because it can move and there's personal standing there trying to fix it. And they have to prepare the bed in a very particular fashion. How do they prepare the bed? 
into the bed where it sits. Do they prepare it flat? They'll have to have some form of kink. Or they prepare it flat, put the pipes and then jam the aggregates around it. Mostly mortar or aggregates are used. Okay. It's a very lengthy procedure trying to get everything. The Germans decided and um, we'll put a flat pipe. A material is immaterial for a pipe because once the pipe is in place, if the savings can be made in the construction sequence, that is a big savings. Flat areas, put the pipe, the pipe won't move or rotate, they don't need any anchoring. Staff are safe in the site. Transporting is safe because it's all flat. And structurally speaking, if you look at a pipe, this is your pipe, it's fully rusting here, okay? As compared to a circular pipe, quite often what can happen is they might be supported in few points, but not in all points. So there might be a structural load on it, okay? Even better is how the load is transferred from the top to bottom. They've figured out that the load transfer works in a triangular fashion which means they don't need a reinforcement at all in the pipe. The only reinforcement they need is when they're handling it, which is the same here anyway. You only need reinforcement during handling. Once it's in shape because it's circular, it really doesn't need reinforcement. It's compressive force. But they found out that that works better, even faster. Okay, so that's a, it's a cluster called Perfect Pipe. There's a lot of different companies working together to make that kind of pipe. You can get pipes with HDPE, which is polymer lining, or without the polymer lining. Whichever way, these pipes are made of very good quality concrete. Okay? They're investing. And that's why we we're try trying to tell UK to watch out and invest. UK is exceptional in that sense that the rest of the European countries are investing in good pipes because we're still using the old technology. I don't know what the story here is, but I presume the concrete technology has been ignored because it depends on the on the cost. If the cost margin is not there, you can't blame them. They, they can't produce it that cheap. Okay. So the pipes need to have certain quality of concrete so that the diffusivity is low. Why should the diffusivity be low? It's a surface reaction. So why should the diffusivity be low? The deterioration is between calcium and, and the sulfate coming from the surface. Okay, So the sulfate has to come from the surface. So it will react on the surface of the concrete. Fine, it will powder the surface maybe a couple of millimeters. But if the diffusivity is very low, it'll find it difficult to penetrate further. So the first layer will go, but it can't go any further. It'll just, it will go, but it'll be very slow. First thing. Calcium. Every cement that you can name has tons and tons of calcium in it, right? It's fully loaded with calcium. What if you don't have calcium? What if you take a cement which has no calcium in it? That reaction can't happen. Potassium sulfate is crystal salt, something like that. Potassium sulfate is a very softer stuff. It doesn't have the reaction potential. Magnesium sulfate is, however, extraordinarily strong. But if you, if you make a system out of sodium or potassium, make your concrete out of sodium or potassium, then this won't happen. That's a new kind of cement system called geopolymer or alkali activated. Okay? They are made, they take the alkali, they take the powders. So it's either PFA, GGBS, what are the precursors to the calcium clays? So they take, they take PFA or GGBS or calcined clay. Calcined clay is just 
laterite, not laterite, tobramorite or any of those clays which has alkali and silica in abundance. They take such clays and they heat them to 800 degrees and that's your precursor. You need to, you know that they are not really hydraulics, so if you add water to it they don't really react. But if you add alkali they will react. So it's your choice what alkali do you provide. You don't need calcium because there is some calcium in these things, okay. But you don't need much calcium so you provide a sodium based alkali. If you add sodium alkali, sodium hydroxide is one of them, it will react and form a stable compound, okay. But it forms a better compound if you add sodium alkali and sodium silicate or potassium silicate. It will make the reaction go a bit more faster and more structured. These are not typically like your calcium silicate hydrate or calcium aluminate hydrate. They are polymers. They have polymeric chain. They have a chain reaction. So you have the sodium silicate hydrate, yes, but they are connected as a polymer chain or potassium silicate hydrate will be like a polymer chain. Polymer chain is okay, but ideally for engineering purpose we want the polymer chains to be connected. If they are interconnected then we get the shear strength and all the required properties that we need and they won't cause any, uh, any form of interconnection within higher diffusivity for example. So that's the idea that we're working at the moment. Um, now we, others are working to see how these polymers can interlink so strong and connect it together so the system is much more effective. Sodium hydroxide is cheap enough. Sodium silicate is not cheap. It's a very well used material and it has a very large CO2 footprint. Okay. CO2 footprint low but it has when you calculate equivalent CO2 it has a larger footprint because it is nearly toxic enough material. It's used very widely in the paper industry for as a glue between the different layers of um, the cardboard that you buy. So it's quite well used material. So the research at the moment is looking at what else can we use instead of sodium silicate. Okay. Also I think everything will shift from silicate pretty soon anyway because silica is used in its abundance everywhere. So coming back to the topic, if you have a concrete which has no calcium or less amount of calcium, they perform really, really well. And we know the alkali silicate made compounds perform exceptionally well in the sewer environments. Okay? Happy enough? You guys are already working on it, aren't you? <clears throat> so that's the reaction. The sulfate's coming in and uh, reacting to form gypsum. The sulfates can also further react with the aluminate phase in the cement and form the ettringite. And they're known by a different reaction a bit later called delayed ettringite formation, DEF. And they're very, very, very expansive stuff, so it'll crack it to bits. And they might look very similar to alkali aggregate reaction as well. So you need to watch out for certain things. Thomasite attack, you really don't need to worry about it. It's when you have the sulfates and the carbonation at the same time. But if it ever occurs, you need to have a very particular, it'll look like a very halo like your alkali aggregate reaction. You need to have limestone, but the reason I'm coming to here is you need to have a temperature low, close to 5 degree. Maybe you don't need to worry about it here, but you need to have the carbonation present, you need to have the sulfates in the environment. Okay. So it has to have a lot of elements together and a cold climate. If it ever occurs, walk away from the structure as fast as you can. It powders the structure. It makes it into absolute powder. So it's not a great deterioration to handle. There's nothing you can really do to handle it. Moisture clearly is a driving force, so you need moisture as well. Okay, I'm going to stop the, yeah, the delayed trajectory formation I've mentioned. That's a picture from the delayed trajectory formation. You can see the halo coming there, but it has nothing to do with the alkali aggregate reaction. It's just the cracking, the extent of cracking. And the fluorescent dye has penetrated all the cracks. And that's why the colors are coming. So, and this is why I suggested petrography needs to be given out 
to a geologist who, or people who are trained, it doesn't have to be a geologist, but people who are trained in the minerals, because they know what they're looking at. They see that every day, and they can really tell things quite easily. If you have the luxury to look at it one more level down using something called scanning electron microscope, ettringite is a very, ettringite forms in the concrete, okay? It, it's in the cement when it forms. But the problem here is it forms after the cement has hydrated. And that's why we call it delayed ettringite formation. So those delayed formation means new crystals are formed. They are quite forceful crystals. They find their way, they crack everything. Ettringite crystals are very needle-like, so if, you're, if you have the luxury to look at them in an SEM, you will tell them quite easily. They are exceptionally needle-like. And if you see them and you see the cracks around it, that way you can confirm that yes, you have delayed ettringite formation here. Okay? Different cracks, um, I don't agree with it, it's Professor Bashir's idea, but different cracks can tell you an indicator of where, what you can expect. I rather believe that different cracks tell you a list of reasons from which you will need to delude which one is the co possible cause. The difference between me and Professor Bashir is that he has tons of experience. I want to spend a few seconds in here. <clears throat> This is what this is how we see concrete. Okay, this is how I see the concrete. So you have the the constituents of the concrete, the mixed design part of it. That results in the microstructure. Okay, the curing obviously plays a large part in how you get the microstructure. That's referred to as the treatment. And that microstructure is the defense that you have against all the transport mechanism. We looked in all the cases. We know. If the diffusivity is low, diffusivity of whatever you're looking at, if that's low, then your concrete has a better chance to survive. So, and that's what we refer to as transport mechanisms. <coughs> We're deliberately not using the word diffusivity there, because if you refer to a concrete under a hydraulic head, then you're looking at permeability, the rate at which the water can go through. If you're looking at nuclear containment structures, you're looking at air permeability or water permeability. I don't know. You look at water permeability in nuclear containment or just air permeability? Okay. So, and that's why we're saying transport mechanisms. Okay. Diffusion is one of the mechanisms. Fundamental for diffusion is you need to have a concentration difference, whether that's CO2 or the chlorides or sulfates or whatever need to have a difference in concentration. The other mechanism is called absorption. Okay? Dry materials absorb quite easily. Do you agree? A dry towel will absorb water. Dry sponge will absorb water. Wet ones don't have that absorption capacity. And not only that, absorption is limited to certain depth from the surface. Because that's the capillary. The smaller the capillary pores, the deeper the section, the deeper the water or anything will be transported. Okay? Think of that very carefully because I have a question on it. <clears throat> so I have a low water cement ratio, high performance concrete, and I have a high water or normal water cement ratio, normal concrete, two of them side by side. Which one will have higher capillary forces in it? Therefore, which one will absorb water? not more water, which will absorb water to greater depth. High performance concrete or normal concrete? Why? You're saying high